How many are enjoying the rain? Is anybody else's lawn looking like mine? You walk on it and you can just hear it crinkle under your feet. Uh, we're in a series uh, that has to do with recognizing the things that God has done in us so we know how to respond to other people who are facing the same things. And we're going to start in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 23. And the first verse, and it says, Then Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, The teachers of the law and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. So you must be careful to do everything they tell you, but do not do what they do, for they do not practice what they preach. They tie up heavy, cumbersome loads and put them on other people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to lift a finger to move them. Everything they do is done for people to see. They make their phylacrities. Does anybody know what a phylacrity is? <laughs> it's a, it was a little box that they used to wear around their head, mostly between their eyes, and it contained a fragment of God's word in it. It would write down, and, and so they would make them, if you wanted to be more spiritual, you'd make them really big. So big that it partly blocked your vision. You had to kind of look sideways to go somewhere. And, and their tassels on their garments long. They love the place of honor at banquets and the most important seats in the synagogues. They love to be greeted with respect in the marketplaces and to be called rabbi by others. You probably have had the experience, I'm sure you have, where you've been looked down on by someone else. In some way, you didn't measure up to their standards or their expectations, and, and they found a way to communicate to you. You don't really belong here. Um, you felt inadequate and unworthy. And I wish I could tell you that the only thing people who make us feel like that do is just create some distance from us, but that's never quite enough. They, they want to communicate their dissatisfaction with you, so they'll give looks of, of disapproval. Has anyone ever gotten a disapproving look from someone? I, I don't know if, if this happens to you. It happens to me. So I, I will be driving down the road at the speed that God intends people to drive, and, and there'll be someone in the fast lane not going as fast as I am. And so I will find a way eventually to get around that person. D does anybody do this besides me? When I finally get up beside them, I look. <laughs> Why do we do that? We want the person to know, you don't belong there. You belong back there. And people who go by me, I've watched them do the same thing, they look. We don't just create distance. We send a message with a look. Sometimes our words can communicate our disdain. Sometimes our actions can destroy reputations or someone else's opportunity, influence or impact their relationships in a negative way. And the most painful part is that if you point it out to people that that's what they're doing to you, they feel they're right to do it. You deserved what just happened. That's a really hard thing to endure. And I wish I could say that we're only on the receiving end of those kinds of things, but the truth is, is that we can all be condescending at times ourselves. Self-righteousness is very difficult to see in others, but a lot easier to, in ourselves, but a lot easier to see in others. Self-righteousness, hard to see in ourselves easy to see in others. Now, in Scripture, people were attracted to Jesus, and I think they always have been. Um, Jesus was righteous, but he had this amazing capacity to not be self-righteous. The most righteous person to ever live lacked self-righteousness. If you think being righteous is hard, try not being self-righteous, even harder. Now, there's, there's a thing that we tend to do. 
It's very common among people, all right? So we like to talk about things we enjoy. So if, if you go out and, and you experience something that was enjoyable to you, you will tend to tell someone else about it. If, if you found something that helped you, like if you found a diet that you actually lost all the weight you wanted and it wasn't hard, you'll, you'll tell other people about that. There's all kinds of things that we will experience. And if it benefits us, if we enjoy it, it's a good restaurant, we'll tell someone. A, a sale at our favorite store, we'll tell someone. A show that's streaming on whatever platform it is that we're enjoying, we'll tell someone. Our tendency is to tell someone else about something we're enjoying, something we think helps us, something that we think makes our life better. If it feels good, if it tastes good, if it makes us look good, we will tell someone else about it. And in a way, it's a way to extend the original joy. There's something about sharing something good with someone that helps you relive the experience you sell, yourself. And I think that's actually a God-intended thing. So we share lots of things with lots of people, but there's something that in our culture we do a lot less sharing about. We tend to not share our thoughts or our feelings about Jesus with others, especially non-Christians. The, the stats are in. We will tell someone about a restaurant. We will tell someone where we found cheap gas. We will not tell someone about Jesus. And it hasn't always been this way. In the book of Acts, those early Christians, they shared their faith in enthusiastic and contagious ways. But right now, Nearly half of all followers are not just uncomfortable sharing their faith. They think it's inappropriate to do so. A recent survey showed that 47% of millennials thought it was inappropriate to share your personal beliefs with a person of a different faith or of no faith. This creates a challenge. If we naturally share the things that we think are good, what's going on with why we're not sharing what we all know is the best thing we've ever found in our lives? Um, another thing that's interesting, in Acts chapter 2, it tells us that those early believers enjoyed favor with all of the people, and the Lord added to their number daily. It's interesting. They had a lot of negative interactions with religious leaders and governmental leaders, but the common person completely supported them. Uh, Christians were being maligned by religious leaders. They were being persecuted by governmental leaders, but they had great favor with the ordinary individual. Among the many reasons for this favorable view by uh, of the world of Christians was the fact that they shared with the poor and they cared for the sick. They actually loved their neighbor, but didn't stop there. They actually showed love for their enemies. And this was quite captivating to watch. So how many suspect, you don't have to actually answer, but how many suspect that there might be less favor in the world today for Christians and for church than existed back then. I think there is, and I think there are many reasons, but I'd like to focus on what I think are the top three. And the first is that some see the difference between what believers say and what believers do. You know, I, I'm sure you've heard someone say, I, yeah, I'm, I'm not going to go to church because I don't want to be around those hypocrites. Uh, just to be fair, I have found that uh, hypocrites exist in every place in society. It doesn't just congregate in houses of worship. But it is fair to say that the church sometimes has a history of stepping significantly out of bounds or losing its way in its mission. And we hear stories of scandals where someone wound up in the wrong bed or they're struggling with an, an addiction or, or they're spending money inappropriately. And we hear things like that and we're embarrassed by it. But if you are a person not connected with the house of faith, you can come to the conclusion, I'm not sure those are the people I want to spend my time with because they say all of these things are wrong, but then they go and they do them. So, uh, second 
primary reason that I think people uh, are uncomfortable or Christians have an unfavorable uh, opinion up by them is that some of the Christian faith is seen as uncaring and highly partisan in political matters. There are people now who cannot separate their belief in God from their political views. And you should know that's idolatry. I'm grateful for people who serve in government. I'm grateful for the causes that they believe in and strive and fight for. But if we think that someone elected to an office or a law is passed is going to save this world or save this nation or save this state, then you have put someone else in the place of Jesus. And as well-intended as they are, they might mildly improve some things for a while, but they're not saving anyone. Our church is a nonpartisan church. We're not a bipartisan church, but we make sure both sides have a say. Our church is a nonpartisan church because we think you have plenty of access to political views almost everywhere you go and with many people you speak to. But I'm not sure people have as much access to biblical things in our world. So we spend our time talking about those things. Now claims from both conservatives and progressives can kind of explain that their politics is more spiritual than the other side. And when the political leaders of the opposing political party steps out of bounds and acts in unethical or immoral ways, it's very easy to call attention to it, while if it happens in our preferred political party, we will tend to at least not talk very much about it, if not ignore it completely. It seems to me is that both people on the left and the right are more concerned about their rights than their responsibilities. And you should know the Bible is not silent about that. You don't have to find obscure references and try to, to milk the meaning out of it. It's pretty clear what our responsibility is. And then there's a third reason that I think that uh, uh, we don't hold very much favor in our culture today as believers, and that is there seems to be an increasing tone that lacks humility and empathy. We're far more likely to argue about what is true than to live what is true. There are people who will just fight at the drop of a hat now. And we have to realize that that's self-righteousness. Self-righteousness looks down on someone else and talks down to them. Jesus lived the truth and he preached the truth. And he did it without belittling others or shaming others. When people spent time with Jesus, they actually felt better. If they were weary, they felt strengthened. If they were sick, they felt healed. If they were discouraged, they felt courage being poured into them. He healed the sick. He encouraged the disheartened. He did all of these things. The most righteous person was not self-righteous, and he could communicate truth in a way that actually lifted people up rather than putting people down. It's not easy. And here's what's interesting, is that the power of Jesus was not diminished by his gentleness. Increasing numbers of people who believe that if you are a Christian, gentleness is out the door. That they have redefined harshness as boldness. And they're not even close to the same thing. Well, aren't you glad you came today? The self-righteous of Jesus' day confused promoting themselves or promoting their cause with promoting God. They actually thought if they were being lifted up or their cause was being lifted up, that God was winning. And, and the Bible tells us that they were experts in some of the texts of Scripture. But though they had once loved God, they now confuse love for God with love for other things. And they treated Scripture 
rather than as a shaping influence of their life as a weapon over other people. They stopped trying to please God and they started trying to impress others. And when you feel like you're doing a good job, one of the things you want is some recognition. You want people to notice. You have to kind of manage people's impressions of you. And if you're doing a good job and people are noticing, you expect some preferential treatment. And so they became more concerned about what people thought of them than what God thought of them. And their, their desire to be seen by others actually blocked the capacity for others to see God. And they called this faith. But it's counterfeit. It's not the same. So in the name of God, they put people down and they made people afraid. And when Jesus showed up with authentic faith, they resented him for it. Now, uh, when we look at people who are all about the rules, it is really easy to start saying in our heart, yeah, I can't stand those people. What jerks they are. And um, there are some who claim love for Jesus, but they really don't want anything to do with the church. I'm sure you've run into them, right? Well, I, I believe in Jesus and I believe in God, but I won't have anything to do with the church. They claim to love people so much that they wouldn't say or do anything that would make anyone else uncomfortable in any way. And they say they embrace diversity in all of its forms as long as you think like them. They've pixelated the truth down from the truth to your truth and my truth. They're very uncomfortable with claims of truth. Uh, when we're looking at people who are good with the rules and experts in scripture, Jesus said in the passage we read that we should do what they say, just don't do what they do. They call a lot of attention to themselves. Uh, you've heard the phrase, don't shoot the messenger just because you don't like the message. Sometimes we shoot down the message because we don't like the messenger. And that's a problem too. If we're uncomfortable with the direction, with the principles and with the commands of scripture, then what happens is we actually develop another form of self-righteousness. We can become uncomfortable proclaiming truth, truth that we don't think is very popular. In the name of tolerance, we can become intolerant with anyone who is less tolerant than we are. Do you see the problem? Now, if I stepped on your political toes, I'm not really all that sorry. Because what I know is, is whether you're on the left or the right, progressive or conservative, I got you today. Self-righteousness doesn't need anything except a human heart that is not completely in love with Jesus in order to wreak havoc in our world. So how are we to deal with this? Well, self-righteousness is not so much about the rules you live by as it is about the rules you judge by. If there's someone you can't stand, you don't want to be around, you look down on, someone you think you'd be better off without, congratulations, you've been infected with self-righteousness. What rules have you used to place another person in an unworthy category? It's as quiet in here today as when I talk about sex. <laughs> so Jesus told a great story about a father who had two sons. And one son, he was very frustrated by the rules and the traditions of the house. And he went to his father and he said, I'd like my part of the inheritance now. And he took it and he went as far away as he could get from those people. And that house, 
He thought rules were just limiting and stifling and ruining his life. And he wanted to live the way he wanted to live. And he did for a while until the money ran out, but it didn't go very well. And he found himself in an unlivable situation. He was in the exact same situation as pigs. And it occurred to him that if he went back home, he knew he couldn't be considered a son again, but if he could just be hired on as a servant, he would actually be doing better than he was right now. So he goes home. But while he's approaching the property boundary line, the father sees him and runs to him and wraps his arms around him and, 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 and puts a new robe on him. It was absolutely fascinating. He thought he would never see this son again. That was his fear. And now he was here. And the only thing he could think to do was to celebrate. So he threw a party. And at this party, the other son, who was the good rule follower, wouldn't come in. He was very frustrated. He was offended with a father who celebrated the return of a rule-breaking brother. And the father went out of the party. He goes out to his son and he tries to help him see what really matters. I thought we would never see our son again. And he's home. And he tells him, everything I have is yours. Come join in the party. The father in Jesus' story wanted both sons in the family. That's uncomfortable news for us. So which group are you more comfortable with, the rule breakers or the rule keepers? Who are you more likely to keep your distance from? What do you think your father would say to you today? So why does this matter? And I'm going to have the worship team come out. Why does this matter? Because we're called to minister to others. We're called to serve others. And it's very difficult to lift someone up if we're putting them down. It's very difficult to serve someone when you don't want to get close to them. And Jesus understood that his righteousness was not at risk for being around people who struggled and who failed. That he had something to say and something to offer and because of that, they could find life and purpose and meaning. They could experience relief from the challenges that they were facing. See, this message is not about self-righteousness and bad is bad, don't do it. This message is more about self-righteousness keeps us from serving the people God has called us to serve. And none of us are exempt from self-righteousness. It exists in every one of our hearts. And so I thought the way we would actually end our talk today is by doing something that would require us to step over some self-righteousness. So I'm going to ask you to do something this morning, and you might be uncomfortable doing it. I don't know. We'll find out. But. Uh, in just a minute, I'm going to ask you to stand if you are a person who's in need of healing. Maybe your body isn't functioning the way that it should. Maybe there's some pain that just you can't find any significant relief from. Maybe you've been given a diagnosis about something you're going to have to manage the rest of your life or will even shorten your life. Or maybe you've suffered a wound that wasn't a physical one, but it was an emotional one, and it's never really healed. The memory of an individual or the memory of an incident still causes pain in your life as freshly today as the day that it happened. And what you need is healing. Or the second group I'd like to focus on is, for you, circumstances in life have felt like they're opposed to you. 
The doors that seem to open for others don't seem to open for you. The weight you have to carry seems to be more than what others have to carry. The kind of options and opportunities that others experience never seem to be afforded to you. And you are frustrated by the fact that if just the circumstances would change for half a minute, then I think my life would be significantly different. And so if you are in need of healing or if you are in need of a circumstance in your life changing, I'm going to ask wherever you are in the room today just to stand up right now. Anywhere you are, just stand up. Yeah. So the first thing I want to say is I really appreciate you doing that. And now I'm going to ask the rest of us I want you, when you stand, to extend your hands towards those who are standing right now. Say, so, well, I don't know what they're struggling with. That doesn't matter. I don't know if they deserve it. That doesn't matter. How many are grateful we have a God in the house today who doesn't give us what we deserve? He gives us something out of the glorious riches of his grace in Christ Jesus. So everyone, let's just stand. Let's put our hands towards those who are already standing. And if you stood up, I'd like you to put your hands in a posture of receiving this morning because God is going to pour some wonderful things into your life. Heavenly Father, we ask right now, we speak healing where there is any sickness, where there is any illness, where there is any disease, where there is any pain where there is any discomfort, where there is any interruption of a quality of life or a quantity of life. We ask right now for your word, your presence, your spirit to come to bear on each and every one of those individuals and to bring healing to them in the mighty name of Jesus. And Father, we stand at doors of opportunity that have never opened to this point and we knock with the authority of your name and we ask you to open every door and change every circumstance circumstance so that this day would actually become a moment of breakthrough in the lives of so many that are in the room today and so many that are watching online today. We command this all in the mighty and matchless name of Jesus. And everyone who agreed with that prayer said, amen. Amen.